So uh, we are super excited to have uh, Mark Resbelt from CWI come give a, give a talk for us today. Uh, Mark did his PhD at CWI and now is halfway in between being a postdoc and halfway in between being a uh, PhD student because you, you haven't defended yet. Yeah. <laughs> but you are officially a postdoc. Are they paying yeah. you like a postdoc? Sorry? Are they paying you? They're paying me uh, almost like a postdoc. It's, uh, so you are in between. I'm in, I'm in between. I'm a, a pre-doc. Got it. Nice. No, no, you're, you're, a, you're a pre, uh, pre postdoc. A pre postdoc. A pre okay. uh, postponed doc. Postponed doc. Okay. So, uh, DuckDB is probably, in my opinion, the most exciting academic database system coming out uh, in the last two years. And as the title says, it's, it's SQL Life for Analytics. So, I don't think there's anything else to say. I think Mark's awesome. DuckDB is awesome. So, go for it. Oh, thank so, you very much. And actually, so the way we'll do this is uh, people can just unmute themselves and ask Mark as, as, we, as we go along with questions. Like, no yeah, no problem. Yeah. So yeah. I, uh, and at any point, just uh, don't literally shout, but uh, it is a bit late here. So yes. I guess my neighbors won't like that, but just ask. That's fine. All right. So I guess I don't need to introduce myself. I could have skipped this slide. Um, Thank you for the introduction and the invite, Andy. I'm uh, very happy to be here as well. So yeah, me and Hannes, in this picture you can see Hannes and me down there drinking beer at uh, almost Oktoberfest. Uh, we made DuckDB, the database system. And um, I'm here to present that here today. Just to interrupt, go back to that yeah. picture. For everyone, go back to the last, last slide. Oh, in sure. the middle, that's Peter Bonds. That's the inventor of VectorWise. An, yeah. an, an, another, so like, CWI cranks out amazing systems. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so Peter is not super involved in actually building DuckDB in terms of like the code base, but we do definitely ask him for advice quite a lot. But he is way too busy with tons of other things. Like he's super busy. He has no real time to code that much anymore. So, but we definitely talk to him a lot. I mean, we used to share an office before uh, <laughs> all this mess. All right. Um, so basically, I have kind of two parts to this presentation. One, the first part is kind of a talk I gave already at CIDR because, uh, well, it was too late to prepare anything new. Uh, and then I have also a bonus part, lessons learned building a database system, which I think is interesting or could be interesting to people that might be building a system right now, like Andy. Um, all right, so before I talk about database systems, I first want to give a bit of a motivation for why we build DuckDB in the first place. And that motivation, it kind of started with data science. Well, what is data science? I just call it statistics on the MacBook. There's a thousand different words for it. It's a very overloaded term. Um, but I think one thing that's kind of obvious about data scientists is they work with data. It's in the name, right? And then we have us, the database researchers. In our field, we've been working for more than 50 years, I think, at perfecting database systems. So obviously, data scientists, database systems, they have to be using them, right? Well, unfortunately not. They use them if they are forced to, such as if they have to take data out of the database system in the first place, but they generally kind of prefer to avoid them, which is a bit sad, right? It makes the database sad. So here's a quote from Hadley Wickham. I can't actually read it because uh, I blocked my quote with this overlay. Um, if your data fits in memory, there is no advantage to putting it in a database. It will only be slower and more frustrating. So if you don't know Hadley Wickham, he's kind of like the R guy. He made, he made kind of all the popular R packages like ggplot, dplyr. It's a huge guy in data science. And he is saying this about our field, about our, like our life's work in a lot of cases. So it's a bit sad. Um, so why is he saying that? Well, maybe they just don't need database technology, right? So what do data science actually do? Well, I think probably the easiest way to figure it out is just look at the packages they use, right? So if you look at like popular uh, data science frameworks in Python, you see the top two are NumPy and Pondas, which is pure data wrangling, right? In R, it's very similar. The top two, dplyr, tibble, and down there, data table, it's all data wrangling libraries. And what do they all do? Well, 
they do database operations. They do sometimes a bit more, but some of them do just database operations or even less than that. They do joins, aggregates, basic transformations, filters. So it's kind of turns out that data scientists, they do need all of this functionality that we are, uh, that we are building in our database systems, but somehow they're not using them. So let's go back to this quote. Why does he think that database systems are slow and frustrating, right? I mean, we've been working on optimizing database systems for, what, 50 years or more? Not, not me personally, but our field. Um, so to figure it out, I, probably the easiest way is to just run a data science workflow uh, with and without a database system, and then just see what happens. So typical database uh, data science workflow, it's kind of simple. You load some data from a CSV file. You do some ETL, some pre-processing. Then you run your analysis, like a really simple sort of workflow. So for our example that we ran here, we have some voter data from uh, North Carolina voters. This is just a data set we have lying around, which is around 300 megabytes in CSV format. Then we do some, uh, in this case, very nonsensical pre-processing where we remove entries. Um, oh, no, this is not nonsensical. Um, we remove entries with a missing phone number or house number, and then we compute the correlation between phone number and house number. That is the nonsense part. I couldn't read it again because this thing is blocking my view. Um, so, of course, correlation between phone number and house number expected to be zero. So let's do this in R. First, we install some required packages. Let's install like data table and dplyr, some basic wrangling packages. Then we run our analysis. First, read the CSV file. Then we apply the filter, and then we check the correlation. It's three steps, three lines of code, and indeed we see no correlation between phone number and house number. Surprise. It's quite, quite easy and convenient. So what, do we, what, what happens if we do this with the database server? Well, for that, let's just use Postgres because it's kind of the open source database. Um, well, first we have to install the database server. And this is not actually trivial without a separate package manager. Uh, and for, for us, at least, on our cluster, we don't have root access, so we have to download the sources and compile it. Then, after we do that, we have to set up some cryptic environment variables, initialize the database, and use this very descriptive pgcutl com command, because in the, when this was created, they had to save bytes on the commands, uh, and initialize our database. Then we install the client. At least this is easy, right? We just install it through the R package manager. Except it doesn't work because the client actually requires you to have the database system itself on your path for some reason. OK, uh, fine. We put the server on the path to install the client, install it again, and then we run it. Now we connect to our database system, providing like the host, the database name, the client, whatever. We create a table. So I have, I'm actually being nice here because you see this dot, dot, dot. This is around uh, 100 different columns because it's a very wide data set. It's very, uh, very, very big statement, actually. Then we send a query where we use like string concatenation to construct a copy command to read the CSV file. Then we can actually use a delete, read the table, and use a filter. So you can already see like all of these steps, they're pretty annoying to do. Uh, your like the installation is more difficult. The usage is more difficult. There's a lot of like pains here. And what about the time? Well, it's a lot slower as well. Uh, and the the whole reason it's slower is actually because of this, because of this client server connection, where you are basically pushing like this whole table, which is around 300 megabytes, over a socket connection, and that just costs you like 10 extra seconds here. Um, so it's annoying and slow. Like, in the end, Hadley is right. For these types of workflows in R and Python, database systems, they are frustrating. They are slow. So what are the problems here, and how can we fix them? Well, the problems that we have kind of identified is that, well, they're difficult to install, difficult to set up and maintain. They have a really slow data transfer to and from the client, and they kind of have a poor interface with the client application. So of course, you have this client server architecture. It's nice for multiple users, but for a single user, it's very pointless. Uh, it just makes everything more cumbersome. Um, the installation needs to be easy. If you use Python, you need to be able to install it all through pip install. Anything else is already way too cumbersome, because then you're already looking into like OS-specific package managers 
like fiddling with compilers, and that's just not happening. It's too much. Um, transfer efficiency is very, very crucial, um, which also we have a paper about in um, VLDB some years ago. Actually, when the picture you saw before of the Oktoberfest was taken was this VLDB. Um, so the transfer efficiency, like the database client protocols, they're not optimized for this kind of bulk transfer scenario. Um, and, they got, and the transfer is necessary because the data scientists, they can't run everything within the server, right? They need to use their like machine learning framework of the week, of the month, whatever, to run their data science work workflow. They're not gonna do like a, a deep neural network within SQL. So they need to transfer this data at some point. And finally, SQL, it's a lovely language. I uh, very much like SQL, but as an interface to, for clients, it's kind of problematic because you have to embed SQL as a string. And it's kind of unnatural, right? You don't get syntax highlighting in most editors. And it actually has introduced the whole class of security vulnerabilities, this interface, which we call SQL injection. Um, it's also not that easily composable. So if you look at dplyr, for example, you can chain operations. So you have like a, a filter and a projection. You can chain them and you can look at intermediates by just pushing like this head uh, function in between at any point. In SQL, you can kind of do that with temporary tables, but you have to write a lot of cruft. You see like there's an extra select star from being pushed everywhere. There's a lot of like uh, cruft around it that you just don't need in this dplyr like interface. So, well, the current database systems, they're not a good fit for data science. Why do we care? Well, the answer is simple, money. Data science is very popular, so we can make money, we can get grants, and then we're happy. But maybe a more like fundamental reason is that data scientists, they are kind of reinventing database systems, right? They are, uh, they are re-implementing joins, these aggregates, they're kind of recreating a database system and are doing a very poor job of it. They're basically ignoring all the research that we as like in the database field have worked on in the past 50 years. They don't use optimizers, they materialize huge intermediates, they don't support out of memory computation, they don't have any parallelism, they don't scale up. So they are kind of making it like a poor man's database that is just like winning or like that, that it gets a lot of usage just because they have a good interface, like a good, um, a good connection to the R and Python communities. Um, and database, Mark? they can solve all of these problems. Uh, Mark? Yeah. I'm wondering, can I ask a question if you don't mind? Yeah, yeah, of course, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, my name is Ling. I'm a PhD student here. Nice, um, nice to meet you. Yeah, so I was just like a, the the the, pre, the previous few slides and also the early introduction of your talk mm -hmm. make me thinking that um, especially at the beginning of the talk when you are talking about the most popular libraries in Python, which are NumPy yeah. and Pandas, right? Mm -hmm. Just like from my own perspective, when I'm using those libraries, I yeah. I actually feel like the the functionality and the feature of of at least for NumPy and Pandas are mm -hmm. a little bit different from my perspective. I feel like in pandas you have lots of like this kind of like database related operations like filters, joins, transformations, sure. etc. But in NumPy, many of the time you are using those um, like um, arithmetic or, or numeric related operations, like uh, you do matrix um, uh, multiplication. Yeah, yeah. that's, that, that's you, a different different side of yeah, it. Yeah, or you do broadcasting, or you have this very convenient interface, indeed related interface with very convenient interface to quickly index a matrix at different rows, columns, etc. So I think oh, yeah. that part would be a very important reason for NumPy. No, for sure, popular for sure. And convenient in the, uh, that is true. Well. You definitely have the matrix stuff as well. That is an excellent point. Um, indeed, that is different, but still a lot of the stuff in NumPy is, is also present in database systems. And you can like, that, that's also kind of the reason why you need this convenient gap, bridge, right, between the two because once you start wanting to do things like matrix multiplication for which the relational models may be not so suitable, then you can easily like go back and forth between what each uh, system has like, uh, what each system is good at, the strength of each system, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, I see. Okay, that makes sense. No, thank you for your question. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so where was I? Here, I think. Yeah, so um, this was actually kind of on the bridge between two things. Indeed, uh, databases are slow and frustrating, but they don't need to be. 
Q my database, DuckDB, well, our database, um, which we call the SQLite for Analytics. The, the reason we uh, call it SQLite for Analytics is because SQLite is really like the most easy to use database if you have used that. And we really, really like it, but it has one big flaw and that is that it's quite slow once you have to do any sort of analytics. Uh, so the core features of DuckDB are actually very sim similar to SQLite with a few big exceptions. There's very simple installation. I'll go a bit more in, into depth there. It's embedded, so you don't have any external server management. We have a single file storage format, just like SQLite. Um, we have fast analytical processing, and we have very fast transfer between our Python and the database system, together with a convenient API for this. Um, so uh, the first question you always get is why DuckDB? Well, ducks are amazing animals. They fly, they walk, they swim, they're resilient, they can live off anything. Uh, and Hannes used to own a pet duck called Wilbur. Here's a picture of Hannes, my uh, former supervisor, now uh, co-worker, still kind of supervisor, uh, with his duck on the boat where he lives because uh, he's a bit crazy, but the good kind. So when you, when you say you used to own a, a duck, where's the duck now? Is it dead? The duck, the duck uh, found greener past, past pastures he yes. um flew he flew away. Off to form a little duck family we we assume wait so like it was a pet duck in his in his boathouse and then it just one day he's like i i'm out of here and flew away well the duck had complete freedom so he would just f be on like the he wouldn't be in a cage you know he would just flim, swim in the canals because this is the canals of amsterdam he would just swim around fly around fly back and sometimes he would already be gone for like one day, two days, but usually he'd come back. And at some point he just didn't come back. Gotcha. So he assumed he met a lady duck and made a beautiful family of duck did it, Now, did, did, did this happen? Did, did the duck disappear before you guys started DuckDB? Yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah. That's, a, a, great, that's a great backstory for a name. <laughs> that's really good. Uh, thank you. It's, it's, it, was a, it was a very sweet duck. I, I watched it grow up. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm still I'm missing Wilbur. All right, so, well, DuckDB, it's a very young project. Uh, it was the first commit I made in the one year and nine months ago, the 13th of July, 2018. Um, as you can see, this is a very bare bones commit. I just added a parser. And the initial system was actually heavily inspired by Peloton. So when I started making DuckDB, I just looked at the parser and the binder from Peloton and just took like half of it. So here you can see a code snippet from the early DuckDB. And it, if you are still familiar with the Peloton code base, maybe it looks a lot like it uh, because it is actually that. Uh, many names are still present. So we have a data table, bind context, string util. But by now, it's mostly been rewritten besides some small things. The string util methods are still there and they're still the same exception types. Um, so here's the internals at a kind of a glance, like. Um, it's a column store database. Surprise, it's analytics. It uses vectorized processing. Um, that is actually probably a surprise to some people that prefer uh, JIT. There's a, a lot of reasons why we chose for vectorized. We have had a lot of debates about this. Um, the main reason, though, that we decided on initially was because uh, we wanted to avoid the compiler dependency, which is very problematic if you want the user to install the system. But there are a lot of good sides to vectorized processing still um, when you compare them with JIT. They both have their advantages. Um, we use an art index. We use MVCC. Uh, it's inspired by the one by Hyper, but has been adapted kind of to be optimized for a vectorized engine. And we use single file storage, which looks a bit like this. It's written in C++, and we use the Postgres parser, which was heavily inspired by the Peloton wrapper of that parser. Can you talk about the the changes you made to the hyper MVCC to, like, to deal with a vectorized engine? Um, well, it wasn't so much to deal with the vectorized engine as it was to deal with bulk updates and columnar updates. So I'm actually um, still looking to write a paper about this, but I'm kind of procrastinating. Yeah. Um, the thing is the hyper MVCC, it has one big pitfall, which is that it always copies entire rows to the undo buffers. I don't know how familiar you are with this. We, we, we implement the same thing. You implement, okay, so yeah. it has one big pitfall, which is that it uh, does the, this like copying of entire rows to undo buffers, which for inserts and deletions is kind of fine, 
But for updates, it gets pretty messy, especially when you have to deal with like large columnar updates. Because if you touch, say, like, if you run an update that copy the uh, updates like one column, but like 10% of the column, yeah. you're copying 10% of your table into an undo buffer. And it might be one column out of 100 columns. So okay. we, we, I think, Matt, we fixed that, right? We don't do that either. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And then the other, the other, mis the other issue with hyper uh, MVCC is the single writer. And I think we, we, got, ar we, we, we got around that too. The single writer? Yeah, there's, there's like some single, like they only have one writer at a time or some, some, there's some, some aspect of it like that, that, uh, that I, deal with. We don't really have this. We do, at least we have one, um, we have parallel writes to different yeah. tables and also to the same table kind of with some like switcheroo on, the lo on some latches here and okay. there. Yeah. Um, but one thing that we have is one committer. Maybe that's uh, one, one like writer to the right ahead log, one committer. Okay. This is what we do have. Yeah, we don't, we don't have that either. I'm okay. not sure of that, but we are also like not really that concerned with like very small like point updates or point sure. writes. We are mostly actually concerned about bulk, and that's why we made these like changes to the MVCC to deal with bulk updates specifically. Mm -hmm. So we have like a different versioning. Also, like our versions are actually vectors, not individual rows. Um, also, to deal with this. I, I will write a paper about this at some point. I also have a bunch of slides I can send you if you want to take a look. Yes, but, we, we, we should, um, the student that wrote the MVC stuff with Matt is not here. He's now a PhD student at MIT. We, mm -hmm. we, should, we should swap notes at some point. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That sounds yeah. excellent. Yeah, I, I spent quite some time on the MVC, uh, first on implementing it in the first place and then on revamping it. So I'm yes. definitely interested. It okay. sounds excellent. All right, go for it, keep um, going, sorry. All right, no, no worries. Okay, this slide I accidentally copied here again. Um, all right, so, well, some, like, a, oh, no, actually, I didn't accidentally copy it. Aha. Uh, so let's go back to the uh, database problems that we had before, and how does DuckDB kind of address these problems? So first, we had difficult to install, difficult setup, slow data transfer, and a poor interface. All right, so first, installation and usage. Here, we actually learn a lot of lessons from SQLite. First off, it's an embedded system. It has zero external dependencies. So all the dependencies are completely inlined. We have an amalgamation build of the system, which means that we can compile all our, all our source files uh, that you need to build the whole system into two files, a header and a, a source file. It takes some time to compile though, like a few minutes, but it does work. Um, we have also integrated DuckDB entirely within the package manager. So you can just type pip install DuckDB and we'll fetch the latest version. Um, does, does that yeah. actually compile it when you go pip install? What does that do? It's at, well, it depends on the system. I think on Linux it compiles. On okay. OS X and Windows it fetches a binary. So it just gets like a DLL and dumps it there. And also from uh, the Python background at Yelp, uh, you can actually get wheels. So wheels is like yeah. uh, distributed binaries. So we yeah. do that uh, very often to speed up our uh, Docker build time. Yeah, we use wheels as well, indeed. Yeah. Okay. So I actually want to set this up. So the, the wheel part, uh, I don't have that much uh, insights into. He said that, but we do use the wheels. Yes. So like how, how for the ones, like Windows should be pretty, uh, that environment should be pretty consistent. I guess OS X as well, but it, I guess, like what happens if they have some funky, you know, they're, they're using the North Korean version of Linux and they try to install this, and if it doesn't compile, do you get an error, and you get a message, or like or just, it just failed, and you, and you don't know? For, Often for time, time, go ahead, sorry. No, no, you go ahead. I, you'd probably know more about this. Than <laughs> uh, usually, uh, the way we set up Python, uh, this type of C++ dependency code, is that it will fall back on compiling. So uh, if it can't find a wheel, so it will invoke mm -hmm. the system compiler to compile it from source. No, but the question is, all right, so if it, if it falls back to compilation, and you're running on the weird version of a flavor of Linux, and compilation fails. Does do, does DuckDB get notified that it that it failed, no. or just or nothing? Uh, only if they open an issue, basically. Got it. That's like, what I'm asking. No, okay, yeah. We, we don't have any sort of reporting back or any of that. Like we don't uh, we don't believe in that either. So there's what? no like. Wait, you don't believe in reporting back? Uh, uh, not not like 
invasively, let's say. Of course. Yeah. Let's keep going. We'll take that offline. All right. Sure. Um, all right. So one more thing. Uh, well, simple installation. Uh, DuckDB does not rely on any external state, which is separate config files or environment variables or like uh, locale things, which can be pretty messy otherwise. And we have the single file format, which users typically find easier to handle. See, for example, Microsoft Office. Um, then we are also having a, we also have a composable interface, which is still kind of a work in progress. Um, and this interface directly connects um, the you to the DuckDB uh, system without having to type SQL queries. You can still type SQL queries. We support both. Um, and the idea is that you can compose these sort of operations. So if you want to have, say, um, a table scan followed by filter, followed by an aggregate, you can have this sort of like db.table, then with the name of the table you want, that gives you a table scan. Then you build a filter on top of that with like an expression. And then you can in, uh, inspect any sort of intermediate there. Then you can run any errors on that. Again, like all of this kind of return is like relation in, relation out. And it's kind of a very thin mapper over the logical operator tree we have internally. Um, one nice part also about being embedded is that we can integrate very easily with uh, things from the source environment. So we have a scan of a PONUS data frame, and we can produce also a PONUS data frame result. And the scan of the PONUS data frame is basically zero copy, except for strings, which is a bit nasty. Um, and that will just run a scan over the PONUS data frame, go through the entire DuckDB query engine, and then on the other end, it can also be just a PONUS data frame again. And then you will benefit from the vectorization um, and from all of our, our entire engine, basically. It can just run whatever you want on a PONUS data frame. We can also run just SQL on a PONUS data frame. No problem, um, which is quite nice. Yes, sorry for sorry, interruption. Just wonder how can you directly scan on a PANAS data frame? Is like your storage format is compatible with data frame format or you do some transformation? It's like... There is for, so it's not about the storage format. It's about our scan operator that emits like vectors basically, right? Mm -hmm. And these vectors can point to an array of data. And mm -hmm. for integers and doubles and such, it's just an array of integers or doubles or what have you. And mm -hmm. Palmas just has the same array internally, right? So okay. because we also run inside the process of the user, we can just get that array and run on that in our system. For strings, it's a bit more complicated because for strings, they have Python string object. It's a bit more of a mess. But for numbers, you can do it without any copying. You just set some pointers and then go. Right, so I, I think I the answer to Len's question is that DuckDB knows about the data frame format. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Got There's it, okay. a, there, we have a, a function, which is essentially a table producing function that has like a pointer to a data frame and then just scans that in memory. Okay. But, but according to Mark, it sounds like that data frame format is just array, I mean, except for strings. Uh, in, internally, Pono's data frame is just a bunch of NumPy arrays, right? Yeah, sure. And the NumPy arrays are just arrays, just C arrays, right? And mm -hmm. we also use C arrays. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah, so kind of the conclusion of this part, DuckDB is pretty feature complete, not entirely. We still need parallelism, which I'm working on, and compressed storage, which I will work on after that. We run the full TPCH and almost the full TPCS. I have not bothered to implement the full outer join yet, which uh, makes us fail two queries, but I get to that as well. Uh, well, we have assets, we have window functions, complex aggregates, we have arbitrary subqueries. That's also very fun, by the way, arbitrary subqueries. Uh, I can give another talk about that. Um, we have compressed execution, and I can't read the other one. Uh, a string collation. Yeah, 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 I implemented that this morning. That was fun. So. Oh, all right. So did you did you use like ICU like an no we actually or? have um, UTF eight proc it's called and it's a okay. very lightweight alternative to ICU that's created by the developers of Julia if you know this um, okay. and it doesn't actually support all of the things that ICU does but it comes quite close it supports like um, string composition decomposition it supports like a graphene cluster detection these sort of things. Oh, it's a single header product. Uh, it's not a, oh yeah, single header, yeah, oh, single header, yeah. 
Impressive. All right, cool. Yeah, awesome. so Thanks. This is what we use because we really don't want to depend on ICU. So we don't actually support full string collation either, like the full, like all locales, shits, not exactly, but a, we probably will add that as like an um, extension at some point because, well, uh, you don't want to link ICU just for that, I think. I think that's a big waste. It's a big thing. Uh, yeah, so DuckDB, free open source. We're in pre-release. We have a website, GitHub. Feel free to try it or take parts of it if you're by chance making a database system. And if you find anything that breaks, please send us a bug report. And then uh, that was the end of my CIDR presentation, but I think I will continue a bit because I still have some uh, lessons learned that I think might be interesting for people that might be coincidentally also developing a database engine, um, potentially, allegedly. All right, so just some quick notes. Uh, testing, what we have learned is that for making a database system, it's probably the best to always just test SQL. Uh, in, in a way, database developers, we are kind of blessed because we know the requirements of our system, right? It's to run SQL correctly. And the internals, like the internals of the system, they're only useful if they work towards that goal of running SQL. So testing internals, it's, it's kind of easy to do but it's a bit of a trap we have found uh, it makes changing them later on very difficult and you will kind of need to change them if you want to refactor them at some point um so some kind of uh history maybe we refactored i refactored slash we wrote the vector implementation twice once to add support for arbitrary vector buffers once to add support for compressed execution i reworked the binder like three times to get arbitrary subqueries to work uh, that's annoying. That's the, we're, we're on the same Yeah, place. so if we're you want actually to take my or uh, our binder, feel free. It does support arbitrary subqueries, arbitrary cor correlated subqueries. Uh, so it's it's quite. I'm I'm pretty happy with the implementation we have now. There's still a bit I want to change, but it's it's kind of funny the binding, right? It's one of those things nobody talks about, but it's actually quite complex. Like it's a, a lot of things yeah. happen. Yep. Yes. Um, yeah, so the planner as well, we wrote, we wrote a bit. Uh, and I think when we were rewriting this, we were quite lucky that we did not have many internal tests. And the ones we did have, they actually cost us some pains. Like we had a bunch of tests that tested the vector, the vector things directly. And I had to like fix those while it was refactoring. It was just kind of annoying. I ended up just removing a lot of those. Uh, so I think test SQL is kind of the, the holy grail and it, it actually makes it a lot easier later on to refactor your system um ah, another point make testing fast um, if testing is slow you don't do it as often it's also kind of developer time you're waiting for this uh, so we have split testing into like a fast and a slow path the fast test just or test functionality on small data sets and it's, it, they actually test a lot. Like you can see here is the fast test. They run in seven seconds on release mode and they had trigger like 150,000 assertions. They, I think they get like 93, 92% code coverage or something like this. Um, but they test only small data sets. So it goes very fast. Uh, and then we have a slow path that tests like larger data sets that test concurrency. So where we have like parallel updaters, parallel inserts. Uh, where we test like trying to like send sick kill to the database to see if it gets corrupted, those sort of things. That's all on the slow path. Those you run as well, but when you are just developing something or refactoring, you just run the fast test. And the, for us, that's very convenient. What, 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 what te like unit test framework are you showing there? Like, what is the that? Is that homegrown or is that? Catch. Some, what is catch. it? Oh, catch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, we really like catch because it's, again, no external dependency. It's just one header. One annoying thing, though, is that because it's one header, it's, it does slow down compilation somewhat, um, mm -hmm. which actually we use Unity builds for now. So any sort of files that are like uh, together in the same folder, we all compile together as like one batch uh, because otherwise the compilation takes like twice longer. And it's not super long, but it, it's kind of annoying if you're running on a MacBook of like five years ago, you know, like it's going to take like um, at least like three, four minutes for a full compile. So it kind of blocks you, it takes you out of the flow. Um, okay. All right, so verification code. I think that's also very important. Um, in the fast test, 
we actually run every select statement four times. Once the original query, obviously. Uh, then we run the query with all optimizers turned off. Then we run the copied query. So we have like a copy for expressions, for select nodes, like everything you can copy. And so we copy the query and run it again to verify that the copy works. And then we also serialize and deserialize and run again to verify that the deserialize and serialize methods work. And I think this is very nice, actually, because this copy and serialize, deserialize is very hard to test for. But this basically makes it just work. Because if it doesn't work, if you like forget one element somewhere to copy it, then your query is not going to return the same result, and you just catch it. Um, Wait, so, so, so when you say unoptimized, it's, it's, you mean like unoptimized C code or un, un, unoptimized like in the plan? Unoptimized SQL. So we turn off the whole optimizer. We run whatever comes out of the planner straight. Just got it. Okay. So we actually, this is why we only do this obviously for the fast test because this also means we don't run join optimize optimization, which means we just run a bunch of cross products usually. Got it. Um, which is actually great to catch bugs in your join implementation because now any sort of join will be run against a cross product plus filter, and if they don't match up, probably you have a problem in your join. So interesting. And yeah, okay, interesting. This this has caught tons of bugs for us. Like it's really, really, really good. Um, for it has been very good for us. So next uh, next advice I can give is make an embedded database, even if you're not making an embedded database, make one anyway for testing. In the end, the the kind of the wrappers around uh, a, a, a sort of database server, it's kind of a wrap around embedded database anyway. Um, and an embedded database just makes it much more convenient to write tests and much faster because you don't need to deal with this whole client server stuff. And if you're sending like individual SQL statements that are running on like one row or two rows, all this like overhead actually adds up and it makes your tests run a lot slower, which again is kind of annoying if you have to run them all the time. So we have gotten a lot of like, um, good stuff from having an embedded database. So if um, before this, I worked a lot on MoneddB, which does not have that or did not have that until we actually added this. And they their testing framework, it takes around half a second, I think, for every single test they run because they start up a database server, start up a client, connect to the database server, run the query, could check the results. And as a result, they they just run a lot fewer tests. Like they... Uh, like their fast tests take like 30 minutes to run and ours take like a few seconds and we actually run more tests in the time. So it's, it's like, it, it really makes a difference in how much you can test as well, right? Because there's always a limit in, in terms of like how long you want to wait. Um, well then automatic benchmarking is very useful. I, I know Andy is, has added that or wants to add it. Work in progress. Work in progress. Okay. Uh, so it detects unexpected regressions, which is very useful. Like here's something that actually we found this morning, uh, because one thing that we don't have yet, which we also want is automatic notification when it actually breaks. So here it was a test that has been running for uh, a year that broke down in December. And we only now found out because nobody was actually looking at this test because it's not, uh, it's just somewhere in our micro test. But actually, it found kind of a bug. And that is here. You can actually see by the commits. We have like a list of commits. If you go on our website, you can see it. And you can see, hey, this commit actually broke it. So you can, like, you know it's here. And what actually happened here is that this between expression broke the index optimizer, which made this thing not use an index scan anymore, but a regular scan. So great, good catch. We probably would not have catch. You, you don't catch these things in unit tests as much, right? Because the answer is still correct. Um, all right, kind of the last point, I think, uh, be careful with dependencies. Um, it's something that we are kind of, we hold to heart, partly because we are forced to by our work environment to hold this to heart. Uh, dependencies, they are very easy for the developer, but they can be very difficult for the user. For example, if they're running a different operating system, uh, they might not have a package manager or they might not have root. And this is actually our scenario on our work machines we don't have root, and which means we can't use the package manager, which really sucks when you want to install things. It really sucks if they have a lot of dependencies. Otherwise, it's fine. Uh, and of course, packages can break. We all know about the left path fiasco, I think. You have a dependency chain. 
just everything can break down if you have like one borked package in there. Um, so the pens, they are a liability. Um, so you should use them with caution. Don't include a dependency on boost just to parse one number from a string, please. I actually found, we actually found this in uh, the, the Python Parquet Reader, like the Python Parquet Reader, uh, that did this. It, had, it has like 20 dependencies, but this one was the most ridiculous. It was parsing one number and it pulled in the whole of boost for that. Ridiculous. And uh, here's a nice quote from the Tinyverse people who are kind of on a mission to, uh, to have less dependencies. Every, every dependency you add to your project is an invitation to break your project, right? Um, yeah, so yeah, like I said, we can use root on work machines if I have not complained about this enough. I actually tried to use Terrier there and I got met with this uh, message. So I was, not, uh, I, was not, I was not so happy. I couldn't use it without first compiling GE Mel. Um, mm. So maybe for you also, it, it would help me a lot if you guys were to not use dependencies. <laughs> Okay, so hold up. Let's go. A couple of things. One is, so you guys don't use GE Mel at uh, all? We don't have it right now. No, we probably will add a add it. But if we add it, we might even inline it or have it as like an option. Right. right. So so we find it gives us like a twenty percent boost, and yeah. that's why we have it. Um, the it's, so you say you have no dependencies, right? So the, you're not yeah, relying we have external on whatever. The, but not uh, actually. This is my final slide, so I'll just put it there. Uh, we have inline dependencies. So we use the Postgres parser. Um, we use like... Yeah, like you, 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 you've copied yes. the code you need into like a third party directory and then you compile it. So uh, how do you decide, like, is, is it just ad hoc? I mean, it's just you and, yeah. and Hannes. Like, how do you decide like, all right, well, we need this feature, we could roll our own, or we could bring in this dependency. Do you have, like, you have a way to judging that? Again, given yeah, your it's, requirement. It's mostly... Uh, what we find uh, would be a reasonable use of our time and how mm -hmm. our criteria is also a bit like how easy is it to inline in the first place so we are making these amalgamation builds which means that well first off everything has to run under c plus plus so we actually have spent some time converting c dependencies like the postgres parts to c plus uh, plus like the actual grammar and the yuck stuff all of this has to be c plus plus um, and the problem is if you want to include one library, you have to include all of its dependencies as well. So it very much depends yeah. on what, uh, like, like the, the cost benefit trade off, right? And we kind of just make that ad hoc. I would say the ones we use are like the Postgres parser because we don't want to write our own parser. We use the UTF-8 proc because we don't want to write our own Unicode framework because this is a lot of effort and annoying. Um, we also use, uh, I think we have somewhere snoppy in there for example because why would we reinvent snoppy you know like that's what is, what uh, sna is snappy snappy sorry. oh snappy sorry yeah, so yeah. it's actually a german course, song yes. Schnee, schna, schnappy. so that's uh, why i pronounce it like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah so we, at, at um, so then um well also the, right, this is the end of the talk so i we don't want to do applause so you can hit the applause button i don't feel like it's an empty gesture, but he wanted to do that to thank uh, Mark. We can do sure. that now. Yeah, um, the... so, so why don't we go around, and if anybody wants to ask questions, you can. And then um, just, I guess, you can raise your hand, we can unmute you, or just, just chime in. Yeah. It doesn't matter. OK, I will ask questions then. Um, the. Uh, I was going to say, um, not for what I was Oh, for the, you didn't really talk about how you, uh, you're built on top of SQLite, or you, like you, you implement the SQLite yeah. API so yeah. that, like, like, so, so when, when you say it's an embedded database, like your code is what, sending SQL over JDBC to 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 the to the the data system or no, it's a book. There's, a there's no there's no it's it's really just like SQLite, you know, like you we have a function called query that takes a SQL string and that feeds directly into our engine. There is no okay. nothing else. We also implement indeed the SQLite API, 
but that is just like uh, we have the header, we have our own implementation, which uses DuckDB under the hood. But we have uh, that as well. But there's no client, we, we, we don't really have any protocol of any kind. We have some REST right. server that we use for one thing, but it's not really seriously, you know, like it's not, uh, it's not our focus. Okay. And then, so, and then for the fast and slow test, so like command line, I, I call make unit test, whatever, that gives you the fast stuff. Um, and then at night, or when you submit to GitHub, you run the slow stuff, how, how does it work? It, it very much depends on what you want to do. So if you want like a basic verification, if your system is not broken, you just run the fast one. Mm -hmm. If you want to debug a test, you obviously run just that specific one, you don't run everything. Before you push the GitHub, you always run all of them. Uh, the, like the slow ones, they take like maybe 15, 20, 30 minutes on like this, depending on your machine. So you but always, you're, you're, before you push, but when you fire off Travis, the build, what do you, what do you, you running the slow stuff? Yeah, or, or so more? actually we have a pretty complex Travis setup. We run a bunch of different compiler systems, of course. Yes. We run our R packages, Python packages on both Linux, OS X, Windows. Uh, we run like GCC 5, I think, is the lowest one, up to GCC 9. We run Clang, different versions. We also have some extra verification stuff. We run, um, for example, we have this vectorized engine. We have one build where we run with a vector size of 2. So uh, our normal vector size is 1,000, but mm -hmm. running with a vector size of 2 gives us, actually detects some other bug, bugs. Then we also have different compilation options. So we compile the amalgamation. We do like our normal compile. Um, we test all of those on Travis. Like it's, uh, I think we have like 17, 18 Travis tests. We also actually run a VM with Solaris in there. It's a bit crazy. <laughs> that, that, that is crazy. Uh, <laughs> Cause, 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 because there cause, are people. Oh. Our people need Solaris to work uh, because there are a bunch of old people that like Solaris for some reason. So. Okay, yeah. Um, all right, any other questions from anybody else? Uh, question. So yes. you said you implemented the, rewrote the binder a couple Wayne, of times. Wait, you should introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I am someone who is currently maybe going to rewrite a binder in the near future. Oh, very good. Okay, excellent. Wait, time out. He, he's an undergrad at CMU. He's starting his PhD with me in the fall. So you, okay. you will come across Mark and when Mark will come across when in the future. Oh, for sure, yeah. As if we still have uh, conferences, then we will see of each course, other. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I was kind of wondering what your main takeaways were for how you should go about writing a binder so that you don't have to rewrite it again, and also whether you're kind of annotating existing objects or if you're kind of uh, figuring out what information needs to be generated and storing that on the side. So it's a bit... Um, it's a bit tricky. I think one thing that is um, kind of crucial for us was this like subquery binding, which is quite tricky. So we started with, I think, something very similar to your binder, which gave us a lot of problems with binding correlated subqueries. So we added kind of like this nesting of binders where you have like different nesting phase of the binders, but also on the expression level. So you have an expression binder that um, has like a different layering as well. So because, for example, you can have a subquery in your select clause um, that can then bind to the variables that are available in the select clause, right? But then within that, you can have another subquery that has then a where clause that has then another subquery in the where clause. And then that one needs to bind in the where clause again. And you can bind on all these different levels. So now on the, on the outer query, you need to bind the select clause. The inner query, you need to bind the where clause. So you have like this layering of these kind of different expression binders depending on where you are, right? Because if you are in, say, a select clause, you can bind aggregates. But if you're in a where clause, you can't. So you have this kind of context there. Um, I mean, I, I think that's kind of the way we structured our binder now. Mm -hmm. One other thing that's important is that you have to, at least for us, we want to do statistics propagation as well throughout the binder because we do overflow prevention using those statistics. So you have to go from like, you have to be able to kind of uh, track those statistics throughout the plan, right? Because you don't want to just give up your statistics when you say leave the select. You want to go from, okay, I have my statistic from the table. I go through my filter, through my where, I go into my select, and then you propagate all those statistics. Your binder's doing that? 
yeah, actually not now anymore. We did it, but this is we need to do this still. Okay. We we used to have this, but we're gonna re-add it. We I, I removed it in one of the reworks. Okay. But it, it needs to the reason we do or want to or used to do that and want to do that still is that we need to have this for overflow prevention. Because we want to guarantee like statically can this expression overflow? And if it can't, then we can use a fast path on the computation, right? So, mm -hmm. so by statistics, you mean, do, do, does that include like the histograms, the kinematics of the columns? For, for us, it's min, max, is null, has, ah. has Unicode, you know, like, because all, for string operations, there's usually a fast path if it's just OSCE. So right. this sort of things, you know. But how about the other things like histogram, kinematic estimation? The Carnelli estimation is done somewhere else, but we don't have a very good one now, actually. It's one of the features that's kind of missing. That's done in the join order optimizer. That's not done in the binder. Uh, kind of a quick question, actually. Going back to what you said earlier, when you said it's based off uh, kind of similar or like look similar to what we do, did you mean Peloton or did you mean ter Terrier? No, I mean Peloton, but I, I guess I you guys see. use some code similar to that now, right? And we, also, we, we ported the binder, but we, like I said, we then we rewrote it twice. <laughs> so uh, la third time's the charm. Exactly. Yes. Uh, do you also use the binder to kind of do validation of like? Uh, I think I just searched. DB also supports like prepared statements. Like, how does? the prepared statement code path differ from the binder code path if it comes to, for example, validating types? So the prepared statements, um, actually one thing Hannes implemented as well, but I do know something about. Um, the prepared statements, they need to have a type, right? And in the binder, we do all of the type resolution. So also this is one thing that um, we had to add as well as like um, for a, a, a function interface that we have, where you have like this propagation of all the SQL types. Um, I don't know exactly how it works for you guys. We have a separate uh, type internally and in SQL. And the reason for that is that we have actually the same internal type for different SQL types. So for example, yeah. a date is just a 32-bit integer, which means we have a SQL type date and an internal type integer. And all of this SQL type information, it only exists during the binding phase and after that it's all converted to the internal types um and the binder does all this type resolution and i kind of forgot your original question uh, uh, whether <laughs> the type resolution also has to happen for prepared statements yeah uh, prepared statements, yeah so the same code path, in the prepared yeah. statement what happens is we have a prepared statement in in the binder that has an unknown type and basically when you have like an unknown type and it gets um kind of it goes down and when it encounters something that gives it a type, we assign that type to the uh, prepare statement. And that can be, for example, a function. So if you call like a prepared statement inside a substring, uh, and it's the first argument of the substring, that has to be a var char, right? There's no other possibility. So then we add a cast to a var char and then, um, and then the prepared statement becomes a var char statement. And then you can only, assign a varchar type to that statement, if you will, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. So when their DuckDB's MIT license, you should just look at that, look, look at their binder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can just, uh, yeah, and if you have any questions, uh, shoot me an email, or we can have like a Zoom chat. I'm sitting at home all day anyway, just the time zone is a bit uh, challenging, but I, I don't mind to answer questions about it either. Okay, thank you. So just a very high level question I have uh, out of curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. So out of all the components of DuckDB, like I know, the storage, execution, a transaction, or maybe, uh, yeah, there's like concurrency control, we call it, or the binding catalog, which part do you find, uh, if you can give a rough estimation, that is like a, you spend the most of time and the most difficult to deal with and why? Uh, this is difficult to say because we have not given each component the same focus. Sure. So for me personally, the most difficult component was the storage. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've, I've not actually, the storage is the least polished part of the system, I think. Okay. Okay. And the reason it was so difficult is because our group has not actually done that much in storage. So okay. in MinetDB, which is the, uh, one of the other databases we have made, they just MMAP some arrays and that's it. They call it a day. 
I see. In VectorWise, they have a very complex storage that was written by basically one guy that has left 15 years ago. Okay. And uh, I've not personally worked with the storage there, but from what I heard, it's kind of a mess. But basically, we are like, as a group, focusing a lot on analytical queries, query execution, these sort of things. So for me, these came very naturally, like query execution was quite easy to do, right, right. which is also why I think this is probably the best component is the execution framework, like for uh, well, mm. the storage, I, I, I had to like relearn how to write a buffer pool and such. Got it, got it, got it, I see. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> Any, uh, any other questions? Um, this is Paulina. I'm a master's student in the computer science program. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about, you said that you have implemented compressed execution, but then you're also working on doing compressed storage. And I was wondering if you could talk yeah. a bit more about that. Yeah, so we actually, um, the way we have implemented compressed execution is kind of uh, a part thing. Um, our vectors that propagate through the systems, they have different... They have a type, as in they have an integer type or a uh, string type, but they also have a, a vector type, which is the actual physical representation. And the physical representation can be anything. It can be dictionary compressed, it can be like a flat array, it can be a single constant as well. So a single constant that's like um, logically replicated, but physically not. And these vectors, they kind of flow through the system in a compressed, uh, in, in, in what, whatever type you want. And then whenever you get to an operator, the operator can decide what to do with it. So we have a method um, that we call Orify because it was, uh, came up with by uh, Ori Erling from uh, Facebook. Uh, he came out with this and um, it basically creates like a thin wrapper over a, a vector that gives you like an iterator over it. That is quite efficient for the common cases. And then we have some specialized code to handle like different types of compression. But it's very like um, uh, modular. So for any function where you want to implement compressed execution or any operator, you can just kind of add a specific type of compressed execution to that. So we don't have everything yet. Like we don't have near to everything and we probably don't even want everything. But it's like the framework is there to allow for anything, basically. So in the case of dictionary compression, are you passing the dictionary along with the vector or are you... Yeah, so the, the vector, the vectors in our system, they have uh, shared pointers to a buffer, basically. And the buffer can hold uh, anything. It's not just a, it's kind of a misnamed. It's not just a bunch of bytes. It can also hold a... A dictionary um, it can hold like a, a lock as well so we can have like a lock on something there or we can have a pinned buffer pool page and it's all in like a shared vector a shared pointer and vectors and that basically means that we can have like a dictionary that's referenced by a vector and as long as that vector is alive the dictionary will also always also be alive it won't actually have to physically go along with the vector just be a pointer but it can be kept alive as long as the vector is alive Okay, and when you say you're working on compressed storage, what are you thinking about? Um, well, there's a bunch of different things. I think uh, from our group, we have the P4 Delta, which will go in there probably for sure. Uh, actually, Peter came up with a new string compression method, which also will go in there for sure. Um, besides that, probably some simple things like RLE or dictionary and such. For now, all our, all our storage is just flat but we are adding like at least like the the, the simple things you know like dictionary rle uh, p4 delta maybe not that simple uh string compression so we're not going to use generic compression like we're not going to use snappy or anything for example we're just snappy snappy sorry snappy <laughs> thank you very good usually i'm the person correcting people's pronunciation at our office so it, it's a <laughs> That's, I mean, yeah um what uh what do your catalogs look like is it just are they tables uh, are they separate data structures they are our catalog is just a bunch of unordered maps but right. they are transaction managed so we actually have a separate code path for our catalog but it is fully managed by the mscc um because we really do want to have things like create table statements being tied to transactions 
Of course. Um, but the main reason we went with this like sort of different representation is because we had a lot of problems in MoneyDB with this. Because in MoneyDB, they use the main storage engine to also handle the catalog. But the storage engine in MoneyDB is very optimistic, which means if you so much look, if you so much as look at the same table from two different threads, the whole system just blows up. Um, like it, it, it starts like uh, undoing things, like saying like, oh, a transaction aborted, there was a potential conflict, you know. And that got really problematic when you wanted to handle the catalog because if two threads would start a transaction, create a table, they would already have a conflict. So we kind of took away from that, that if you're doing optimistic concurrency control, maybe you don't want to do that for the catalog. So, hmm. okay. We, um, as are in, are in the catalog and they are transactional, or sorry, our catalogs are in tables and they are transactional. Um, mm -hmm. So it sounds like it was, it was sort of an engineering limitation of MoneyDB rather than something more fundamental. No, they could be stored as uh, tables as well. It's just that. Um, but, I, but, I think, but I'm saying, like, but with the, the issue of like what you're describing of Mo, the Mo, MoneyDB yeah. problems, it sounds like it was an engineering problem, not a fundamental yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. It's, it's, it's. I, I think either way, it's kind of fine. Um, there is some duplicate code that we have in the catalog that deals with the transaction stuff. Yeah. Because it handles it kind of in a different way. Um, I think if you're making a system that's pretty good with like. Uh, point updates like the, it's not super optimistic it's fine to store it as tables as well i think there's no fundamental objection to that but i think for like a optimistic engine like we ran into these problems and for us it's also kind of easy to just have like an unordered map of tables you know like it's it's kind of simple in a way as well oh, it's, easy, it's easy to bootstrap because it's you know chicken for the egg problem um yeah all right i have two more questions and then uh we should let you go because it's it's late for you, unless somebody else has an yeah, question. Yeah, no problem. Uh, um, so you mentioned that you're, you're using shared pointers. Have you found that to ever be either a performance issue no, or just that? No, we, we use unique pointers almost everywhere. Okay. The only, the only case where we use shared pointers is actually in this vector buffer. And I, I, I thought about it a lot. And we ended up doing it because we, I, I saw no other good path to implement this. Okay. And the reason for that is that... Um, uh, the thing is, if you have a um, vector that has like a dictionary, for example, um, we have like operations that just reference a vector. And you have to have somehow some sort of shared ownership there, or you transfer the ownership. But sometimes it's a bit iffy because if you have, for example, a case statement, a case statement gets two vectors as inputs, uh, or well, more, but could be two. If you then have strings, you don't want to copy all the strings, you just want to have like pointers to them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so because of that, you can you have like the case statement that has uh, re relies on this sort of string area, and you have the original vector that relies on the string area. So it is like inherently a shared thing because you can have multiple vectors depending on the same sort of data. But for the rest of the system, we all use unique pointers, and I th I really think that was the good choice as well. Like unique pointers everywhere. We uh, in in Peloton, we just it was it was a wreck. Um, we are doing something different in our new system. We don't use shared pointers. We actually made our own pointer type, um, and we do we manage memory separately. All right. My last question is: uh, It's an embedded system, so it's single threaded, right? Or like, how does like how right does now? It, uh, so right now it's single threaded because um, it's running in Python or whatever, actually, right? Like, sorry. Because you're running in Python, you just can't like you use whatever thread you're given. No, no, no. You can you can launch any threads you want. Of course, uh, there's nothing stopping you from launching threads from the C code in Python. Okay. Like uh, only if you want to interface with Python things do you have to actually respect this. But you can easily run the database engine in parallel, gotcha. which we also will do. Uh, so DuckDB it is currently single threaded per query, but we have full support for concurrent queries and uh, such. So you can run n updaters n inserters n uh, readers well, however many you want and most of it is uh, not gonna interfere with each other unless you do like single updates point heavy workloads then you have a lot of interference obviously but that's also not what we care about um what about like background threads again so like if you if if, if it's an embedded system and you, you're told you can only have one thread or like 
I guess they're in the yeah, back so, they can do whatever they want, right? Like, yeah. So we, uh, it's, it's basically, we are, yeah. People can do whatever they want with the system. That's yeah. kind of, it's, it's, it's a chat. It's somewhat of a challenge because people can mess with it, of course. Um, but yeah, we, one, once we add the multi-threading, we will allow the user to limit it as well, obviously, because they might, they, they want to, you don't want to run full eight cores on your uh, laptop for no reason. Right. Maybe a database, not that important always, you know? So, right, so you have, do you have checkpoints? Like you have, you have a background thread, take a checkpoint. No, no, no. Yeah. So this is one thing that we kind of decide on as well is we don't want any background things. Okay. So the checkpoints actually are pretty ugly, uh, but they will just trigger once the database reaches a certain size, like they are, and they will just be part of the, whatever made the database exceed that threshold. So we made the conscious decision not to have any background, anything like that. So, 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 so no background GC. No, no, no GC. Okay. Interesting. Everything is run just inside the, the query. Like if you call duckdb dot query or whatever, yeah. everything end to end, that's all duckdb will do. Like there's no, uh, background, anything like it's kind of, a, kind of a, kind of a contract. The philosophy a little bit more, just curious. Can you elaborate uh, the decision on not having any background thread a little bit more? Or just yeah, so the thing is that because we are running, um, so there's actually, I have some extra slides on this. Uh, aha. Okay, I'm never going to find this. Uh, uh, yeah, resource sharing. Okay, I guess it's this slide. Can you guys still see the slides? Oh, yes. Oh. Uh, unskip. Okay, resource share. Yeah, so resource sharing, it's kind of a big thing for us and not for standalone servers. Because if you run a standalone database server, you have no, it's yours, basically. Like, you take up the whole computer. But for us, we don't just run on someone's laptop, probably. We run in another process. So we really want to kind of respect this boundary somehow as well and not just go like, you don't want your Python process that you are typing interactive queries in to just randomly hang for a few seconds because your database decides it needs to checkpoint, you know, or like your database decides, aha, you haven't done anything inside the database. I'm going to checkpoint, which makes a lot of sense for a standalone server, but not so much otherwise. So mm -hmm. yeah, we have been looking a bit into adaptively uh, doing resource sharing as well, but it's something that's pretty tricky. Like it's not probably not something we're going to, really look into but we have considered this mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. okay uh any other questions last chance